Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the last study of this week. As we continue to look through the words and the articles that this author has published, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction? And shall we thank him for the many blessings that he has provided through this week? Shall we now seek him in prayer? Gracious, loving Father in heaven, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We come before you to ask for your guidance and your direction. Help us now so that we may address that which has been written, comparing this with scripture, seeking you and seeking your guidance in all things. Help us now. Be with us, we ask. May your spirit enlighten our minds so that we may truly be able to divide the word of truth. Be with Theodore on his trip. Be with those that cannot be here today. Be with those that will view this later. And help us in this discussion that we might understand And together be able to sort through what you would have us to understand at this time. Be with us now. May your angels protect us. For this, Father, we thank you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as we return to the third of the so far published 12 articles. We left off with the following paragraph. Before I go any farther, I simply want to point out that I believe we all know it is only the Holy Spirit who can give us the ability to correctly interpret prophecy. But the question is, does the Holy Spirit work randomly, picking one here or one there? Or only through those who have developed laser-sharp methodologies that are dialed in through years of academic study? Or does he work in playing principles and rules so that anyone can learn? And concerning those principles and rules, does he just leave us to guess what they are, somehow trying to do our best? Or does he clearly identify them for us? As we progress in these articles, we will see that he does, in fact, clearly identify them for us so that anyone can understand. Nicely, yet very disjointedly written, it could easily have been more easily said that you can seek to understand the Bible by allowing Scripture to be its own expositor, Or you can allow the Bible to be interpreted by the word of man. The Holy Spirit is very definitely involved. The main question that he's asking here is, does the Holy Spirit work randomly? Or does this, does the Spirit work broadly? I think we have an answer for that through Scripture. Because the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. Yet there will be rain, such as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that could be falling all around us, and many not understand. Now, he continues, types are different than simply reading the Bible verse by verse. He begins a new thought here with very little showing us that he is going to go into this thought. No warning. So types are different than simply reading the Bible verse by verse. They are somewhat similar to parables in that they use something tangible to illustrate a spiritual truth, yet not quite the same. Bible types draw largely from the Old Testament and use people and events to illustrate a spiritual truth or to actually predict a future event as they are prophetic by nature. Though not as numerous, you can also find them scattered through the New Testament as well. In the study of the life of Samson as a type, it can be shown that he clearly delineates at least three church periods that are described in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, the premise is that Samson as a type 
can be clearly shown and that he represents these periods of revelation that they're that shown in revelation two and three now if that's the case then for samson to be representative of a type he would have to be showing a type that occurs in a church period and then skips other church periods to come to revelation three so at least that's what I'm taking from this from this sentence. Is there anything that you're seeing? Is there anything that anything else we could point out before we go on in this in this article? Okay, one of them is the Philadelphian Church. In the historical account, Samson assembled three hundred foxes with torches between their tails and sent them off into the Philistine fields to burn up the shocks of standing corn the vineyards, and the olive trees. This account is found in Judges 15, 4 through 5. In the Millerite movement of the Philadelphian church, we are not looking for 300 foxes to accomplish a work, but want to understand what those foxes represent. Those foxes brought in a flame that specifically removed three things from the Philistines, the shocks and the standing corn, the vineyards, and the olive trees. So in other words, we're talking, if we're looking at the shocks, at, shocks and corn is one thing, the vineyards as another, and the olive trees as a third, the vineyards would be doctrine. The olive trees would be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The shocks and the standing corn, would that be scripture? How else could we approach this? Well, I take it that the corn there is uh, meant to be wheat, so I think that would be a reasonable application of them to be uh, products. Okay. Now, he continues, in the Millerite Philadelphian time period, there were 300 charts produced that were called the 1843 prophetic chart. These charts contain the prophetic information of Daniel and Revelation that clearly showed where they were in the stream of time. As they ran through the country, they burned up or removed the corn, wine, and oil, representing the people who were ready to be harvested from the Protestant denominations of that time. This represents the transition from the Church of Sardis to the Philadelphian Church. Now, it's interesting to me that he would make this portion of the statement, the transition from the Church of Sardis to the Philadelphian Church, after already presenting that the Millerite movement of the Philadelphian Church was where he was beginning. So there's, for me, a, a problem in that portion of the, of the representation. Now, does anybody else have an observation on this? I remember looking at Foxes. And uh, I think it was a, a text in Ezekiel. Okay. It mentions them uh, relating to being like false prophets. And then you have the tales being aspect where it talks about in Isaiah, false prophet is the tale. So I'm, uh, I would have issues because that would be a sort of suggestion that the, the Millerites were in some sense, some sense uh, false prophets. Okay, now why he would reference Revelation 2 and 3 when he is making his points primarily out of Revelation 3 is of interest. Now, his article continues that the following quote from Joseph Bates details the decision and surrounding circumstances that resulted in the production of 300 of the 1843 prophetic charts. In May 1842, a general conference was convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, Brethren Charles Fitch and Apollos Hale of Haverville of Haverhill presented the pictorial prophecies of Daniel and John, which they had painted on cloth 
with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. Brother Fitch, in explaining from his chart before the conference, said, while examining these prophecies, he had thought if he could get out something of the kind as here presented, it would simplify the subject and make it easier for him to present it to an audience. Here was more light on our pathway. <clears throat> these brethren had been doing what the Lord had shown Habakkuk in his vision 2,400 68 years before, saying, write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. After some discussion on the subject, it was voted unanimously to have 300 similar to this one lithographed, which was soon accomplished. They were called the 1843 Charts. This was a very important conference. Camp meetings and conferences were now being multiplied throughout the Middle and Northern States and Canada, and the messengers were proclaiming in the language of the message, the hour of his judgment is come. Now, of course, this is Joseph Bates' recollections 26 years after these had been presented. In the narrative, Samson caught 300 single foxes, but then he tied them tail to tail, causing them to run as pairs through the Philistine fields. The 1843 chart contained two specific and distinct messages, that of the first and second angels. These messages ran as a pair through the Protestant churches. The third angel's message did not arrive and was not proclaimed, until after October 22, 1844. Time was the test when the first two angels sounded the 1840 to 1844 time period, but since then, prophetic time is no longer and is never again to be a test. Early writing, 74 to 75. The firebrand between their tails represents the light and the power given to these messages by the Holy Spirit. The same concept, the 300 foxes and the firebrands, can be seen in a different way with the 300 men of Gideon and the lamps within their pitchers. We will be taking a closer look at this in part five of this series. It was after this time period that the 1850 chart was developed and produced, and in a letter dated 1850, Mrs. White let us know that on her return to Brother Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision, showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables, and it would cause many to decide for the truth by the three angels' messages, with the two former being plain upon tables. Letter 28, 1850, paragraph 5. The truth made plain upon tables is referring directly to both of the prophetic charts letting us know that the two former, the first and second angel's messages, are in the 1843 chart, with the addition of the third angel on the 1850 chart. Mrs. White also lets us know that these two charts, in particular, are a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. Here again, he gives the reference to Great Controversy 392.1, and refers again to letter 28 of 1850, paragraph 5. He asks a question in the title, Why are these foxes important to us? It is important for us to realize that the information that those foxes or charts imparted were arrived at by much prayer and a very specific method of study. The prophetic information contained on both the 1843 and the 1850 charts are a safeguard to us just as the Ten Commandments are given on two tables of stone are a safeguard. The charts keep us from straying into a false interpretation of the established time prophecies that made us who we are, and the Ten Commandments keep us from straying into a false interpretation of what God requires of us. Now, his comments within this paragraph are presented with a very broad stroke. So I'm, I'm not extremely clear 
as to the answer with these question, this question in the title, with what he's trying to put into this paragraph. Are the charts important? Yes. Are the char- are the commandments initially given also important? Yes. But as we have studied in other books, the commandments and the statutes are both important and are both to be kept. Now, no other denomination arrived at the prophetic conclusions that the Millerites came to. We know with certainty when Christ moved from one apartment of the sanctuary to another, when he arrived in the courtyard, when he moved into the holy place, and when he moved into the most holy place. As a result of the method of study employed by the Millerites, we have the three angels' messages, the investigative judgment, the true state of the dead, the Sabbath, health reform, and others. Now, I recognize that the Millerites came to the understanding of the the state of the dead, but everything else came subsequent to anything that occurred within the Millerite time frame. Any thought or question? Uh, Just an article concerning these foxes. Yes. So they have a fire, which could be symbolized Holy Spirit as well in some way, but they, in a sense, consume these shocks, the corn, the three uh, products. So if they were false prophets, that would be sort of what false prophets, prophets would do, that they would uh, destroy the word of God, they would destroy the Holy Spirit, destroy whatever, Holy Spirit, and, and uh, the other example, I don't remember. Which. So I'm just sort of having... On questions concerning the application of these 300 foxes through the charts. Right. I mean, just, just because there were 300 foxes and there were 300 men with Gideon and there were 300 charts, I don't know that we can combine all of these into a single symbol or as, as, as he's trying to state, a single type. As we progress in these articles, we will identify this specific method of study. And we'll also see a system begin to emerge within Adventism that would eventually neutralize our ability to see prophetically. Here again, this is kind of a broad statement. This Millerite movement of the Philadelphian church period was short-lived. And as early as 1852, Mrs. White began to refer to us as Laodicean. Review and Herald. 10th of June, 1852. This was before we, the Adventist Church, were even an established denomination. What happened or changed that took us from a profoundly spiritual movement just a few short years before to a place where we could qualify as Laodicea? To better understand, we'll let Samson continue to enlighten us. The account is found in Judges 16, 21 to 26 and is the subject of the next article. His conclusion for this, these two charts, the 1843 and the 1850, have been the subject of much controversy within Adventism. It is not my purpose to try and convince anyone concerning the validity and the significance of these charts, though scripture and spirit of prophecy bear that out. Rather, it is to show that they are actually the three angels' messages in both a written and a pictorial form. More than that, they represent the actual experience the Millerites passed through in their order that qualified them to give the message. And that is the point. Now, one of the, one of the comments that Theodore had made, and one of the comments that I have to agree with, is we need to be able to set our case before people so that it can be clearly understood. Now, his point, we accept that the charts are the subject of a lot of controversy. It's going to happen. They were controversial in the original time period. Now, his statement that the charts represent the actual experience the Millerites passed through in their order that qualified them to give the message, that's an interesting interesting statement at this time. 
In Christ's time, only those who received and lived the messages of John the Baptist and Jesus went on to actually receive the correct understanding of the present truth in Daniel 9. Is that a good statement? Is it a correct statement that in Christ's time, that only those who received and lived the messages of John the Baptist and Jesus went on to actually receive the correct understanding of their present truth, as shown in Daniel 9. Would you agree with this statement, or would you disagree? Well, there was people aware that the Daniel 9 prophecy was occurring. The fulfillment of it was occurring at that time. Jesus preached. The time is fulfilled. I think a lot of people understood that was uh, relating to Daniel 9 prophecy. So a lot of people who would have understood that the time period still maybe didn't go on to receive Christ's prophecy and still just went into darkness, even though they they could have maybe understood it. But even the, the disciples... Did they understand that Christ was crucified in the midst of the week? Did they understand that the end of that uh, 70 weeks occurred when Stephen was stoned? I, I don't I don't think they did understand that. That wasn't really understood until Samuel Snow began to uh, present that in his third, of, third paper, I think it was, in 1844. That, uh, 70 weeks was began, began to be discussed around that time. I know that the midst of the week idea. So, yeah, I would have maybe, um, I don't really see his, where he's going, or what his connection there, what he's saying. Okay, the reason that I'm having a problem with it, there were those prior to the message of John the Baptist that received a correct understanding of the present truth in Daniel 9. You had Anna, who lived to see the birth of Christ, and was the the man's name Simeon that was also there that had been promised he would see the Messiah before he died? There's a lot more. So that's correct, right? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Yes, that's correct. Okay. The depth of what we see within Daniel 9 shows us that there are those that if they are willing to study, if they are willing to apply biblical truths, they they will be willing and able to make and rightly divide the word of truth so that when what they are making is an understanding of the time in which they are living. For them, that is just as much present truth as what we're addressing here. So I have a problem that only those that received and lived the messages of John the Baptist and Christ had this correct understanding. Maybe I'm being too critical, but I'm just I'm not fully agreeing with this with this sentence. As he continues, likewise with the Millerites. It was only those who received and lived the first and second angels' messages who then went on to receive the correct understanding of their present truth in Daniel 8. Now, would we count or discount William Foy under this particular statement? I mean, there's quite a bit that he had that was presented that we would have to agree was truth. Now, The first two prepare for the receiving and the giving of the third. The very same principle applies to us as Adventists. Only those who receive and live the first and second angel's messages will understand the present truth found in Daniel 11 and will go on to give the third angel's message. Realizing that the three angel's messages are contained on those charts should let us know that there is much more for us to understand about them than just what we see in Revelation 14, 6 through 12. In the 1840 to 44 time period, they simply hung the charts up wherever they could and began to preach their experience of the first and the second angel's messages. Using the principle that precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, 
line upon line, here a little and there a little. They had eaten and absorbed these messages until they came to the point of becoming the messages themselves, proving that the three angels, these three angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. Letter 79, 1900, paragraph 32. Now, in this, he's cursorily or very lightly touched upon the 300 foxes. He's made application of the 300 foxes being similar to the 300 men of Gideon that had their torches hid in their pitchers. And he's attempted also to apply the 300 charts as being like the 300 foxes. But there's an issue. There were 300 of the 1843 chart produced. I don't think it anywhere states how many of the 1850 charts were produced. And it wasn't for many years, for a period of about eight years, before the 1850 chart had been produced, that you would have the two charts available. So the the position that I'm seeing here is kind of tenuous. Any other comment or thought at the moment? Yeah, I would have it in my understanding that there would be 300 1850 charts in it. But I'm a bit, I wouldn't have any, I would need to sort of go and research it to sort of clarify that just very much. Okay, thank you. Brother Dwight? Yes, sir. Eight of 300 foxes are unclean animals. Yes, sir. How would that, how would that, uh, be spiritually, the, uh, how would that be the 1843 charts? In other words, <clears throat> how would that be spiritually relevant if the use of an unclean animal, an unclean animal is given as a representation of giving God's message, right? But wouldn't that be an unclean message? Wouldn't that be a um, false message? If you have 300 fox and they're unclean, wouldn't it be a false message? Well, at the at the outset of the meeting, I asked the question, given what the foxes were, were attempting to destroy, and I'll go back up to the top of this real quick, quick that I didn't, I didn't hear the first part of it anyway so i'm sorry no no you're fine your your question is very much on point i, think, I just think it's kind of confusing he put the he, he, he um, tries to make the 300 boxes to be the 1843 and eight, the 1843 chart right well what my point was at the outset of the meeting if we look at the corn, the wine, and the oil, spiritually, if we look at the oil, we have been studying that the oil is a representation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that the wine is doctrine, and the corn would be the word of God. So if the destruction of the Philistine farms of their corn, wine, and oil, would that be a would that be preventing them from receiving anything from God? So, thank you in the uh, in the chat for the comment. Um, yes, it'd be nice if we are able to find a way to confirm that there were three hundred of the eighteen fifty chart. But let's also remember our meeting tomorrow will be the prayer meeting, and we will not have a morning meeting. So we've come to the end of this particular document. Now, we'll go into the next one, but there's something I'm going to look to prepare for the Sunday morning meeting that we will talk about toward the close of our time. So I'm opening up the next document. It might take a moment. Part four, Samson's descent into Laodicea. If we look at our Seventh-day Adventist church from a perspective of size and organization, it would surely seem that we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. 
Our financial status is impressive, along with our various medical institutions, schools, universities, etc. We are also well supported by ministers, ministries that operate from within the church and from without. But how is it with our souls? Do we truly understand the three angels' messages as we should? Do we know how to become those messages ourselves? Do we know how it is that we enter the sanctuary above and unite with Christ in working out our own salvation with fear and trembling? So we shall not be weighed in the balances and found wanting. Manuscript 168, 1898, for chapter, or excuse me, paragraph 20. When we look at the life and the experience of Samson, we see high points followed by corresponding low points. Though there were several victories in the career of Samson, ultimately they did not check his downward trend. This trend was set in motion when he turned aside to look at the lion and ate of the honey. In this article, we are going to look at the lowest point in his experience in order to gain the perspective of our present low point as Laodicean Adventists. Here, the quotation is given, And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3.17 In the account of Samson's fall, we find a perfect description of the Laodicean condition, as he was most certainly wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. When brought out for the Philistines to make sport of, he was undoubtedly naked, or nearly so, in order to highlight his massive physique making the connection between his condition and our condition as Laodicean Adventists gives us the key we need to understand the rest of this portion of his story. Verse 21. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Here is poor Samson, blinded and bound, on top of that forced to grind in the prison house. Question, so what do grinders do? Answer, they grind up the corn and wheat. For what purpose? To put it in a form that can be more easily utilized and digested. It doesn't work well to just throw a few handfuls of raw wheat in a pan, along with some olives and some other necessary ingredients, and somehow expect to produce a good loaf of bread. That would not be very edible. The wheat must be ground into a usable form, just as the olives or the oil must be in a usable form. In other words, the oil or Holy Spirit must come to us in a usable form, the method, in order that the bread or the scriptures can be put into a lesson we can digest. Okay? In the chat, the comment is made. It says the chart. We stated in our last that about 240 would cost near $250. But we have since seen Brother Nichols and have ascertained that 300, the number to be published, will cost not less than 400. Of this sum, Brother Nichols pays $75. As the chart costs much more than we anticipated, it is necessary that the price should be more than was stated in number four. The price then will be $2 each, a small sum for such a treasure. Brother Nichols has spared no pains to have the work done correctly and well. We are much pleased with the arrangement of this chart and the execution of the work, and we are satisfied that it will be a great help to those who teach the present truth and prove a blessing to the scattered flock. Those whom God has called to give the message of the third angel can have it free. Those who wish can send in their donations. And if more is received than enough to pay for the chart, it will be used in publishing the Review and Herald. All letters relative to the chart should be addressed to Otis Nichols, Dorchester, Massachusetts, Post Paid. This was published, the Review and Herald, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Paris, January 1851. So the inference there is that when the 1850 chart was being addressed, that 300 of those were also being produced. So thank you for that.
What do you think of the statement is that the Holy Spirit must come to us in a usable form? I'm questioning that myself. I would say we must come to the Holy Spirit in a usable form. Point taken and point agreed. Isn't that what our Adventist scholars and theologians do as well? They take things of Scripture that are hard to understand and guide them into usable lessons for us. Something we should be able to eat and digest, causing us to grow spiritually. But wait, Samson was in prison, and not just any prison, a Philistine prison. Not only that, he was bound by fetters of brass, not of iron, not of silver, not of gold, but brass, and he is blind. Now he returns to what he was trying to do in the last article. In this type, the Philistines represent Protestantism. As we have seen, the 300 foxes which went through the Philistine country are the same as the 300 charts which went through the Protestant churches and brought out those who were ready to be harvested. The Protestant churches recognized the Millerite proclamation of the first and the second messages presented through the 1843 chart as a fire which swept through the ranks as the destroyer of their country. But now Samson is blind. He has lost his eyes. Not one eye or three eyes, but two. Two things. Remembering that just a couple of years before 1852, when Adventism started into its Laodicean condition, they had two things that contained the prophetic understandings of the three angels' messages. The 1843 chart, along with the addition of the 1850 chart. The first and second angels' messages were contained on the 1843 chart. And the third angels' message, along with the repeat of the first two, were contained on the 1850 chart. The way they arrived at that prophetic understanding was through a very specific method of study. But here is Samson confined in a Philistine prison and using a Philistine millstone to grind Philistine wheat. In other words, Adventism in its Laodicean condition has lost its ability to see prophetically because it is grinding the wheat, so to speak, using Protestant methodology. The prison represents the overall system or the box which confines him. And the millstone represents the Protestant methodology, which, is actually, which actually grinds the wheat. The Philistine wheat, in this case, represents the many different versions of the Bible published by the various Protestant publishing houses. That's an interesting introduction. To me, that's also, I mean, it's, it, it may be something to look at, but I mean, I'm trying to figure out how I prove that. Protestant relies on the historical, grammatical, and higher critical methodologies to form its conclusions. Also on the many different versions and translations of the Bible. And we have fully embraced all of this in our own interpretive processes. This is the precise thing that has changed. That is, we no longer study as did our pioneers. In other words, it seems that our modern scholars dismiss the technique of our pioneers as a method of interpretation that is not sound. And in so doing, they overlook the simple fact that the method the Millerites used gave us the platform of truth that we now stand upon, including all of our prophetic understanding that was based upon time. The method they used was able to give the trumpet a certain sound. It's almost as if a presentation is being written by someone with a Methodist background because we're stressing the method, the method, the method, rather than sola scriptura. But what has produced these methods of interpretation in the first place? To rephrase the question, 
what is the overall system that limits us to these methods and prevents us from utilizing a method that would allow us to arrive at the correct interpretation. Understanding what these fetters do <clears throat> and how they accomplish their task will help us to see this system for what it is. Fetters, <clears throat> a chain for the feet, a chain by which an animal is confined by the foot, either made fast or fixed as a prisoner or impeded in motion and hindered from leaping as a horse whose fore and hind feet are confined by a chain. To bind, to enchain, to confine, to restrain motion, to impose restraints upon. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The Philistines were known for their workmanship with both iron and brass. Yet they bound him with brass fetters. According to our definition, these fetters are accompanying, are accomplishing a very specific purpose. Their main function is to impede his ability to move around freely and to keep him at his task of grinding the wheat, all the while preventing his escape. When you think about it, they made doubly sure that Samson could not escape, as he was not only in prison, but also bound with these fetters. And even if he should somehow escape, he would not make it far as he was blind. Coming down to our time as a type, what would we look for that would bind or limit the ability of our Adventist scholars from going to and fro in the scriptures freely, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little? and forced to grind the wheat using the historical grammatical or higher critical reasoning as their method of biblical interpretation. All the while, these brass fetters preventing their escape from this system. So, in a very specific way, what's being said is that the theologians, the evangelists, the leadership have been taken captive are blind and have had fetters placed upon them. Why brass? Metals have great significance in the Bible, and this is the case. And in this case, it explains how the fetters accomplish their work. The metal used here, that of brass, as compared to iron, silver, or gold, shows us the nature of how the fetters hindered or restrained Samson. In other words, each of these metals have a corresponding characteristic. Now, Daniel 2, the figure, the head is of gold, the chest and the arms are of silver. Where does the brass factor in? If we were to look at either of these, we would be looking that brass would be the equivalent of what we have seen with Greece, right? Yes. So if he's being confined by his brass, the point that he, he works through now with Daniel 2, would correctly identify the equivalence with this with Greece. So he states here, to find out this characteristic, we need only go to the place where each metal is described, which is found in Daniel 2. Each metal corresponds with a kingdom, and brass is used to represent the kingdom of Greece. Gold represents Babylon, silver for Media Persia, and iron for Rome. To understand the characteristics of each metal, we must first understand the leading characteristic of each kingdom. Briefly stated, Babylon was known for its pride. Daniel 4, 30 and 37. Media Persia for its infallible decrees or commands. Daniel 6, 8 and 15. Greece was known for its system of philosophy or false education. Acts 6, Verse 9, verse 17, or excuse me, Acts 6, verse 9, and then Acts 17, 15 to 21, and Rome for its reliance on law or legalism, Acts 16, 37, Acts 22, 25 to 30. Now, in this situation, when we look at the dream in Daniel 2, from what what this is stating, from what the article is showing here right now, the metals, yes, are being described in Daniel 2. I'm not arguing that point. Now, 
in this, would we state that this is the first place where these metals are so described? I'm looking right now. Okay, we would find that, that this reference would be primarily in Daniel 2. I thought brass could have occurred earlier. So we would have Daniel 2 and Daniel 4 as being our primary reference to this with brass. And there are some references in Daniel 5 and one in Daniel 7. Well, you have brass being mentioned before. The mirrors, the ladies had contributed to uh, building the sanctuary furniture. But in the context of representing Greece, I think, uh, yeah, Daniel 2 would probably be the first place. I'm just surprised because this is Hebrew 5174, but this word that's being translated as brass is corresponding to the Hebrew 5154, 20 words earlier. And the one that's being used in Daniel is strictly the Chaldean version. Yes, yeah, that part of Daniel 2 would be the Aramaic. Okay. So if it was used somewhere else, it would be a yeah, different word. Okay. But there are multiple other words in the Hebrew that are being used as brass or coppery. So we have this from the Chaldean, and we will continue. To put these fetters in their proper perspective, it isn't pride that has caused us to embrace these methods though it will most assuredly prevent us from giving them up. Our infallibility in our adherence to them, though we make the claim that they are the only correct way to study, or legalism, which views these methods as the end rather than the means to the end. But the fact that they are made of brass tells us that it is the system of false education that has actually corrupted the historical grammatical and produced higher critical methodologies in the first place. As we study Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 to 17, we see clearly how the principles of false education have infiltrated all of society, including Adventism. It is highly significant that Greece was the only kingdom of the four that was to bear rule over all the earth. Their system of education relies on human reasoning instead of divine revelation. These educational principles are taught from kindergarten on up through all major universities and have penetrated to every corner of the globe in some degree. It is also equally significant that the little horn, the papacy, which is waxed exceedingly great, originated in Greece. Now, I'm looking here just, just because I want to understand better. Okay. As the Protestant churches are returning to its mother, Catholicism, so we are returning to our mother, Protestantism. Catholicism simply using, uses Protestantism as the vehicle to deliver its methods and doctrine straight to us, just as Delilah used a man to actually cut off Samson's hair resulting in the loss of his physical and spiritual strength. This we will clearly see in the study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. So he's making a new leap that the cutting off of Samson's hair can be tied with Daniel 11, 31 to 45. As some of our leading men of the past begin to return to the accepted method, of biblical interpretation. They also begin to change the views of the investigative judgment, the 2300-year prophecy, the daily, and other distinctive Adventist doctrines. As a result, they gave up our doctrines and left the church. But in doing so, they also left behind the seeds of doubt concerning our established method of study. It was when our young men began to attend outside schools of theology thus relearning their Protestant methods of interpretation, that we began to return to our mother, the Protestant denominations. Behold, everyone that uses Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, 
As is the mother, so is her daughter, Ezekiel 16.44. Mrs. White lets us know that because of their rejection of the first and the second angel's messages, the Protestant denominations experienced a moral fall in 1844, and they have continued to reject the special truths for this time. They have fallen lower and lower. See Great Controversy 389. The painful point to make is that the system of Protestantism and their met methodologies is not our friend. More than that, it is positively an enemy to Adventism. This is true on many levels, and we are slow to perceive this fact. Okay. Here he comes to his next conclusion. By adopting and employing the methods of interpretation of Protestantism, we are allowing them to confine us to their system and remove us from our weapons. Their conclusions become our conclusions because we are using their formulas. What weapon did Samson use? He used a jawbone of an ass. Right. Now, he used the jawbone of an ass. He used foxes. He used his strength. Do we find him in the descriptions shown in the book of Judges, using a javelin, using a spear, using a sword. So when we're looking at this, and he states that, like Samson, Samson had his weapons removed, and that we have had our weapons removed. Here, he now reaches into the book of First Samuel. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. And they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goods. In their day, the Israelites went to the Philistines to have their implements sharpened. These implements were used to cultivate the ground so that the crops would grow. In our day, we are going to the Protestants to have the theology of our ministers and our scholars sharpened. But our ministers and scholars are to help us grow spiritually. But the Bible records, yet they had a file. In other words, the Israelites had a file but chose instead to have their tools sharpened by the Philistines. We, too, have a file to sharpen our instruments. And this is the subject for the next article. Gideon's men and Jacob's sheep will help us to see the importance of the correct method of study. Okay, I see the comment in the chat. I'm going to read it. This style of attaching thought to thought without a clear line upon line of scripture reminds me of Jeff Pippinger's recent style of study. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you. One of the points that is being done within this is multiple ideas, multiple concepts are being introduced without laying a good groundwork and making your point case by case. Here we have an issue. Here we have a problem. Very directly, we've been going through a series of articles that offer many biblical points, but the thought process is very scattered. Are we this scattered in our thinking and in the way in which we are presenting things? I would hope not. Now, as we have just completed the fifth of 12 articles, uh, find the style of study we are using. We are using is very meticulous uh, method of methodical. You know the word I mean. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, line putting it on the line. If it doesn't fit on the line historically or theologically, it just doesn't fit. It's an outlier. And, uh, yeah, no, this style of study is definitely freehand. Well, as we have been studying since 
July 18th of 2020. One of the things that has has come out multiple times is the willingness to listen and to examine in detail what others are saying. And also the willingness to be corrected by each other or by a reference or we can state things that we think, which is okay. Right. Wait for confirmation somehow. Right. Yeah. Like this morning was a good, really good example. You know, the 300 charts. Well, as we assemble together, we're not here to be critical of each other. We are here to examine what others have to say and to, in a, in a manner of speaking, accept or digest what they're saying to see if this is, is something that we can continue to present. Now, are you saying something that we could use in, as a study, study guide or something? Correct. On the topic. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, I'm working on something. I hope to have this ready for Sunday. And if this, if this comes together the way I think it can, I will be asking those that participate to be my jury. I'm not going to ask you to be a judge, but I am going to ask that you be a jury to assess what is being put together. What I'm looking at here in these articles have led me to, to really be able to focus that we need to establish what we are saying so that we can present these things in a very detailed yet logical form so that we're able to cover point by point to support our thesis and come to our conclusion. Yes, study sharing others' discernments. Agreed. Now, each of these articles individually have been have seemed to be assembled haphazardly. And that hurts me to have to say that because I know the man that's written these articles. Simply uh, an observation. Really fair observation. Okay. Now, I don't want to go into the next article yet because it's going to open up another series of thought. So let's, at this point, if there's any other comments or any other questions, I open the floor. What have you seen so far in these articles? Are there things, are there points that you would you would ask further or comments yeah. that you would read? Yes, it gives lots of lots of material for thought, that's for sure. I mean, definitely. Okay. I uh, just uh, a point in what you uh, had read today. Yes. Uh, he mentioned that Thompson went kind of astray when he when he passed the line. So I would say that we'll probably go back further than that. He didn't really want to stay when he began to seek a wife in the Philistines. All right. I, you know, I do like the the connections he's making. I'd like to see not all of them, but you know, definitely there's there seems to be connections, but to see them connected in a way that can be supported by scripture, that's what the prophecy references. Okay. Yeah, it could be could be something solid there. I don't, I don't think all of it, but definitely there's gems in there. All right. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your support and for attending these meetings. So shall we now close our time together with prayer? Loving Father, we thank you that we have this ability to be able to study together. We thank you that we have been blessed by that which you are providing for our consideration. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon this author. We ask as well, Father, for your blessing and guidance through us and for us through, through the efforts that we need to make through this day. Direct us now. Be with us in all things. Help us to understand that which you would have us to do. 
We pray as well, Father, that you will continue to guide Theodore and keep him safe through his travels, through his hiking. We thank you that you are doing this for us as well. Until we meet again, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.